Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. In our last two weeks, if you were here in person or online, James, the half-brother of Jesus, has told us that God intends for each of us to have a strong faith, a faith that is tempered by trials and a faith that resists temptation. This week, we find that this strong faith that God intends for us has both accelerators and decelerators. Or for those who need it a little bit simpler, a gas pedal and brakes. With all of our rock roads here in Chase County, it may be appropriate to think of thick sidewalls and knobby tread versus flats or getting buried to the axle. While a certain energy drink may give you wings and a certain hot beverage may open your eyes, it is obedience to the Spirit of God that gives you wheels. Having wings may be a good thing. Having wheels is surely a good thing. But having wheels without an engine to turn them does you or Christ's kingdom no good. We have to fire the ignition. Now, I admit, I'm from the combustion engine days. And so when I say fire and ignition, you realize you may push a button in your world, but we need ignition if we're going to have motion. A week ago last night, I had a moment of terror. While in Wisconsin, for the 20 years that I lived there, where it is common to not get above freezing for an entire month, while there, I learned to go out and to start my car every couple of hours to let it idle so oil would flow throughout the engine, it would lubricate, the alternator would top off the battery so that two hours later when I come out in the sub-freezing weather, it would fire again. Last Saturday, towards the end of our drug-free watch party, one of our young men offered to go out and start vehicles so that they would be warm. I had pre-thought this predicament. I, I reasoned, well, I can always walk home if my car won't start. But I had failed to remember to go out at halftime to increase the likelihood that it would start. Faith is the ignition that starts the engine of discipleship. And some of you are wondering, did the car start? Yes, it started. I got home. It was all good. I didn't even have to walk across the street. Some have summarized this book that describes the engine of discipleship as faith 
that works. But faith that works is born from hearing. On this point, both James in front of us, in this verse, let him be quick to hear, and Paul in Romans agree. For Paul wrote that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. To piggyback on Macy's story, the only way to get a white cloak is to hear the word of Christ. And so James says, let us be quick to hear. Let's be swift to hear is another translation. We live in an information age where we are bombarded with a deluge of facts, opinions, and ideas. That was not the case during the Bible times. Literacy was rare, so they could not read the facts. And uh, traveling philosophers only occasionally came to town so they could hear their ideas. So in James's day, the challenge was to be open to new information. Today, the challenge is to fill your minds with good information. To fill your minds with the truth, let every man be quick to hear the truth. To not only hear the truth, but if we look ahead a couple of verses, in verse 21, to receive the truth with meekness. To receive what comes. What happens when the first rain falls on soil that has been in drought? Drought causes a crust to form that is hard for the moisture to penetrate. We must break the soil with meekness, which allows the value of the rain to drive down and implant near the roots where it can make a difference. We need to break up the hard, crusty soil of thinking that we have it all together so that we can receive the truth and allow it to penetrate deep where it can nourish our roots. We must be quick to hear and slow to speak. Am I the only one here who has to remind myself to listen to both the facts that are being shared and the feelings that are being communicated? Rather than just to listen to respond. Many of us listen just long enough to come up with a response. Yeah, but don't you know? And so to be swift to hear and slow to speak means we have to have the weakness, the meekness, let me say that again, the meekness to listen to the facts and the feelings that are being communicated. See, when the word that was spoken by God that begets creation and that begets salvation that we saw in the last few verses, back in verse 18, when the word permeates a soul, we find in verse 18 the intent of God that Christian people would be the first fruits of his creation, that we would be prominent of creation. When we allow his word to change us from the inside, we become the example to the rest of creation. See, it's not enough to simply hear sermons or even to memorize and to quote scripture. We have to allow the truth to permeate and to transform us from the inside out. If we don't cultivate the soil and receive with meekness, water runoff may be good for creeks, it may be good for streams, it may be great for the ponds, but the runoff doesn't do the pasture as much good. 
It's when the rain gets into the roots that the pasture is nourished. And it's when the truth gets into us that it begins to transform and renew us. Not just to hear the words, not just to be able to quote the words, but to allow the truth to transform. This is the ignition. This is the beginning of generating power that will move us forward. I guess I could apply it this way by saying that every single person, every I guess James puts it this way, every single person who wishes to have a saved soul must hear and receive God's truth. You know, listening is the fuel that generates motion, but motion that is uncontrolled is reckless. How many of you remember the old-time cars at Worlds of Fun? It's been so long since I went to Joyland, I don't, I don't remember much about Joyland and Wichita, but I do remember the old-time cars at Worlds of Fun. Once I figured out when I was in upper elementary school that the rail was going to keep the car from going too far off course, the goal of the old time cars was to floor it until I rammed the family member who was in front of me. I know the rules say do not ram the cars, but I knew my steering wasn't going to make much difference. I just needed to go and hit my sister's. See, motion without restraint causes collision. Motion without restraint causes collision. And some of us get so excited about our ideas and we get so excited about our opinions that we generate motion and we don't know when to hold it back. So James says we must be swift to hear, we must be slow to speak. The brakes that slow us down is we need to put the brakes on our speaking. Sometimes stopping momentum is what we want. Sometimes it is not. Three months ago, my ministry assistant was in Wichita when her car was running, the ignition was working, and it got her into the middle of an intersection, and then it wouldn't move forward. Sometimes we break on purpose, and James gives us three times that we need to hit the brakes. And the first one of those is that we need to hit the brakes when we are being driven by human ideas. We must be slow to speak. It is better to remain silent and thought to be a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. I have learned that frequently students who are silent are actually a sign of deep thoughts. There are some who, like me, We respond too quickly to end in awkward silence. But when others who are slow to speak, when their thoughts are drawn out, they stun the group with their death. I I did not do this with permission, but I think it's a glowing compliment. It's intended that way. Ray Crawford is one of those who's not quick to speak. But oftentimes in his quietness, you know, he's thinking. He's mulling something over. So when you finally draw it out from him, it's a nugget of wisdom that we need. See, we need to hit the brakes on our human ideas so that the Spirit of God can do something inside. Not only do we have human ideas, we also have a problem with human emotion. That anger does not accomplish the purpose, the righteousness of God. 
the prohibition is necessary to avoid those that you may know who they may not be loud, but they seethe in silence. Those who are silent on the outside, but screaming on the inside. Those who use the silent treatment as a weapon. Not only must we be slow to speak, but we also need to be equally slow to allow anger to take over. You may be hearing, and you may be silent, but silence does not indicated absence of the third description third dis- instruction let us be s- swift to hear slow to speak and the third instruction slow to become angry then we also see it here in verse uh, 21 the third time that we need to apply the brakes not only if we're about to talk too quickly not if we're going to act out of anger But the third time is when we are motivated by human filth and wickedness. There's an intentional contrast between surface evil and deep righteousness. Surface evil happens when we speak too quickly without thinking. But when we allow the truth of God to permeate and to soak into the soul and to transform us from the inside out, the deep truth of God's word is exactly opposite to the quick fly off the handle response. See, surface evil is immediate, but the implanted word requires time. The word has to permeate deeply, it impacts the roots, and then it's got to travel back up and out in a lush plant. See, rather than living skin deep, the challenge is one of character. To allow the truth to sink deep into your personality so that when the soul is tapped, pure, refreshing wisdom is what oozes out. I wonder how many of you have been told, count to ten and then reconsider if what you plan to say actually needs to be said. Some of us need the count to ten that we be slow to speak. Any family member who has ever received that look because they were acting inappropriately knows exactly what I'm talking about. Mama may not need words if she's filled with anger because of what you are doing. Am I right, husbands? How many of us have heard, what's wrong, honey? Nothing. To avoid the filth and the wickedness of immediacy may require extended times of silence. It won't be long until our students begin the track and field season. Some will train for sprints, others will train for distance. And sprints and distance are complementary skill sets. James wants us to discipline ourselves to allow the Word of God to sink deeply so that we can go the distance of wisdom. I guess I would apply this second point by saying that wisdom includes both quickness and slowness. The Holy Spirit is calling us to evaluate what we should do quickly and what we should do more slowly. See, it's not enough to simply allow the car to idle. We have to put it into gear I guess that's an automatic transmission. I guess we'd go into first if you're on a manual. It's not enough to allow the car to idle. We've got to put it in gear. We've got to move our foot from the brake of hastiness, and we need to give pressure towards action. The accelerator of action to live out our discipleship. To hear, 
but not act is described as deceiving yourselves in verse 22. And to hear but not act, it befalls people of every denomination. And yes, even non-denominational Bible and community churches as well. Those who hear, slow to speak, but we're also slow to act. But, Dave, but James says, we need to act. We are to be doers of the word and not hearers only because that deceives ourselves. And, and, and he uses the image of checking your image in a mirror. Ancient homes would have only had a mirror if the family had extraordinary wealth. They couldn't just travel down to Dollar General and buy a 99 cent mirror. It's not like our day where every single lavatory that you encounter has a mirror. The mirrors that did exist would have actually been made of highly polished brass, not the glass or the uh, silver metals that we use today. So much more common, if they did not have a polished brass mirror, would to see one's reflection in a pool of water. The contrast in verses 23 and 24 is a person who gets a glimpse of who he is in Christ. He sees the reflection. He sees himself or herself the way God has made us as a new creation. But the problem is the person who walks away and he does not live consistently with the image that he saw in the reflection. Those of us who know up here the way God sees us, but we don't allow it to change our feelings and our emotions or our actions. The remedy then is to reflect upon the perfect law because the perfect law tells us how God sees us. See, when we read about law... If you studied the word of God, you know that there is the law of Moses. There is the law of Christ. And here James describes something called the perfect law. The law of Moses was a law of a covenant. And even after the dawning of the new covenant on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came to indwell believers and gave them a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone, Paul, the very same Paul who wrote in Galatians 3.12 that law and faith are not the same thing. But this Paul told Timothy, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So even the Old Testament law of Moses is good if it is used lawfully. A wrong use of law would be to allow it to bind us or to give us some sort of a false sense of security. Well, I kept the rules, so I get to go. Anything less than perfect is not a white cloak. See, the law never gave salvation. The law always pointed towards a need for grace and for mercy. And so we have the law of Christ, which takes the law of Moses and it applies it rightfully. At least seven times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has said, You have heard it said, but I say. And so there's something different about the way Jesus sees the law. So if Jesus had to correct what religious people had turned the law into, and Jesus had to turn that back to what the lawgiver intended, then we find the law of liberty, which is a perfect law. When Moses' law is viewed correctly as explained in the law of Christ, it is not bondage, rather it liberates. 
John chapter 8 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my words, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and truth will set you free. Jesus' expectations are not a source of bondage. They are a source of liberty. That is the perfect law, the law of freedom. The liberating truth is what Jesus promised, Paul honored, and James is highlighting here in verse 21. Now let me be clear. Obedience never justifies because it always comes short. I don't care if your t-shirt says KU or K-State or Wichita State or Emporia State or Pittsburgh State. Anything other than the righteousness of Christ is insufficient. But the law of Moses and the law of Christ indicate that obedience that increases fellowship between the Redeemer and the redeemed. All of us who have driven on ice know that going and stopping is not the whole scenario. You must control the direction of your motion. And so we see the steering wheel of discretion. The ignition of hearing. The brakes of being slow to speak. The movement of action and the steering wheel of of discretion or direction. The scripture says in verse 26, but unless a man bridles oneself. I know a little bit about livestock because I used to have dogs. A bridle is different than a tether. A tether, a fence, or the chain on a pet are intended to set a boundary. Go wherever you want, but no further than this boundary. A bridle, on the other hand, is used by another to control the direction and the pace. A tongue that is bridled pours forth what is in the heart. And so all of us, we start, according to the scriptures, with an evil heart. And so if your tongue is is pouring forth the evil that is in the heart, it's not a good thing, but we must bridle, we must control the direction and the pace in the process of being renewed. It says, if anyone thinks he is religious, he must intentionally make sure that his tongue is obeying the reformed part of the heart and not the natural part of the heart. We can't allow the natural evil to come out. We must intentionally draw from the good. I guess I see it in the scriptures in Matthew chapter 15. Jesus says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. The steering wheel of discretion says you can't follow your heart. You can't simply say what comes to mind. We must direct the direction, and we must steer the pace. I, I guess I see here that he ha- we, we must bridle our tongue. And then it goes on to say that we, we must visit orphans and widows. Almost everything that James has said to this point is talking about how you deal with yourself. But now we get to verse 27 and he says, this isn't all about you. Sometimes you need to be concerned for others. Others who are afflicted. Others who are ignored. He says pure religion. Religion is a very rare word in the New Testament. This word religion, in that context, simply means to express devotion to some transcendent being. And so religion can be to to Buddha or to Zeus or to Diana or to... Whoever, if anyone is devoted to a 
transcendent being, that is religion. Religion is not only about you getting to heaven or having a happy life. Devotion to a transcendent being, in this case the triune God of the Bible, demonstrates concern for the afflicted. Pure religion demonstrates concern for the vulnerable. This, this uh, phrase, orphans and widows, is shorthand for any who are vulnerable. There was no social security department in the first century. It fell on families. And those without husbands or those without parents were especially vulnerable at this time. As early as Psalm chapter 68, verse 5, God's wisdom, God's care, God's provision for the widows is declared. We must minister to orphans and widows in their affliction. Not all widows need the same attention. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3 specifically says, if they have family, the family ought to be the first to care for her. But if they have no fair family, church, you're on deck. You're up to bat. There's a sense in which we are our brother's keeper. If we are devoted to our transcendent God, pure religion, we do care for. We do give watchful attention to others. And then finally, we read that we are to keep oneself unstained. Few things will total one's life faster than impurities. Impurities can clog up a carburetor or block the fuel injectors. A dirty fuel filter can prevent you from getting ignition. Contaminants can cause a transmission to slip or an engine to seize. James is saying here what Paul would say later in Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He's saying don't let the world force you into a way of thinking, but rather allow God's truth to transform you from the inside out so that you are not conformed to the world, but you are transformed by truth. We are to be different. And James tells us, to keep oneself unstained from the world. Bridling the tongue is just one way of renewing your mind and not following your heart. I I could get really political right now and focus on who are the vulnerable that we should attend to, but instead I'll let you wrestle with that question. I'll let you wrestle with your participation With God. If God looks after the vulnerable and God calls us to partner with Him, I'll allow the Holy Spirit to drive that home. Someone um, has, has accurately, Ed Stetzer, has accurately described the 21st century America as being catechized by our politicians and discipled by the media. James says that undefiled devotion to God is involved in the lives of others. It avoids the world's stains, whether they be red stains or blue stains or green stains. We avoid the stains of worldly thinking so that we pursue a devotion to God alone. We must be defined the very end here of verse 27, unstained from the world, we are defined by God's description, not anyone in the world. We're defined by that reflection that we see in the in the pond, in the stream, in the mirror. We see ourselves the way God sees us, not the way anybody in the world sees us. 
I've given applications throughout the, the sermon for each point. But let me conclude the message this way. Charles Swindoll, a radio preacher and a local church pastor in Texas, summarizes this portion of Scripture with three pieces of advice to those of us who want to avoid the gaps between our head and our heart and the breaks between our heart and our hands. If the way that we think changes the way that we feel, changes the way that we behave, he first says, don't divorce the truth from your speech. Secondly, don't divorce the truth from the needs of others. And finally, don't divorce God's truth from your moral purity. Our response song this morning 